raised 15 uh, million in funding, and according to his website, he has tripled his sales year on year, which doesn't, I imagine, put any pressure on him in the future. So, without further ado, Alistair. variations on this talk. So I've pulled some of the slides from various um, talks I've given in the past. Um, there are many lessons. I've tried to distill them into the five big ones that I guess we've learnt um, getting Huddle off the ground and hopefully flying. Uh, but there's an alternative name for this um, talk, which is how to raise millions without giving away. I used to call it without giving away your business, but it turns out you do have to give away chunks of your business if you want to raise millions of um, pounds or dollars in <coughs> capital. So I've called it how to give away your, um, build a business without giving away all your money. Um, but that's just, I guess, one of the lessons. Um, it reflects that sometimes building big businesses does take quite a bit of cash, not always. Um, so one of the lessons definitely is around money. So um, I won't focus too much on money, but I'll try and include that as one of the five lessons. A bit of introduction to me. Uh, so I went to Southampton Uni, did engineering, masters, was a shipbuilder, um, failed at that. Um, tried marketing, failed at that. Um, tried tea tasting and various other things on the route to three or four startups, three plus, I guess, one within another company. Um, so always done startups, always done web. That's about 10 years now. Um, and Huddle is, I guess, the, the third proper startup and going pretty well so far. What are we trying to do with Huddle? Um, the problem that I had, so basically I did two startups out of uni, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then I went to work for a company called Dunhumby, which if you have a shop in Tesco and use their club card, um, that owns and runs all the data off the club card. So it's all about marketing and insight. Um, we built a very big business, about $60 million within that business. They sold out. I took some of the money and started Huddle. And the problem I was trying to solve with Huddle, and I'm still trying to solve, is helping businesses to work together. Or more specifically, when you join the world of work outside of the life of a student or your social life, why is it still so shit? And can we make it a little bit easier for people to work together? Um, and that's the problem we're trying to solve with Huddle. So that's what the website says, um, Cloud Collaboration for the Enterprise. Um, it's a B2B product. It's boring software, enterprise software. Um, but we're trying to change it from within. And what does that actually mean? Um, well, basically, it's all about um, us, you lot, we can decide how old the Generation F or the Facebook generation is. But it's essentially that um, the way in which we all work now, especially in our social lives, Facebook, etc., is very different to the way you have to work when you join a big, boring company. Um, and you expect Facebook, that's what you use outside of work, and then you arrive at work and you get something that looks like that. Um, and the difference is remarkable, isn't it? Um, and it leads to a lot of that. Um, and you think, why do I have to get on the phone to help desk? Uh, why does it take me months to talk to IT? Why doesn't this thing actually work? Um, and it just means that generally work sucks a bit. So that's the big trend. The big trend is that working in a business on traditional enterprise software is very hard. It's very difficult. The software is pretty terrible. It's expensive. It's slow. It's designed for old school ways of working. And the new way in which we work is completely different. Now, this doesn't mean Facebook for the enterprise. That's, that's a tool that is pretty useful. There's some nice tools out there like Yammer, I guess, things like that. You know, you guys might have heard of that are doing that. This is a general trend of um, the way in which you work, the way in which we share information, the way in which we connect with people, the way in which we use software needs to become a lot more easy, a lot more virtual, a lot quicker, simpler, more social, easier to get stuff done. So that's what people are wanting. They're wanting tools like that. But when you get into work and you join well, you could join IBM or Microsoft themselves or any big business, um, you find that the tools that you used to use and that you love using, you can't use anymore. So there's a bit of a revolution going on. And that's what Huddle is, is trying to do. And the reason why this is important is because when it comes to your five lessons, or not five lessons, but the five things you might want to think about getting your business off the ground, it's all about what are the big trends, what's happening, and how can you be part of that big trend. So our big trend is about making it easy to share content between everyone in the business as it is on a tool like Facebook. So getting rid of email, making it available on your phone, on your iPad, whether you're inside the business or outside the business, whether you work in a team or an organization or a department, helping you to seamlessly connect in the cloud wherever you are. That's what a huddle is. It's like an online version of what we're doing now, basically. 
some awards and press, some customers, um, a, a story that's about four years old, a bit longer. Um, it takes a while to build big enterprise businesses. Um, you, um, it's a bit like, I guess, like building a factory, right? You build a big, complicated, complicated bit of machinery, you raise some money to do it, and then you get it there. But when, once it's up and running, you can really crank it out and sell it to lots and lots of people, sell the thing that you're making to lots and lots of people. Um, so that's the, st the story of Huddle. It's about four and a bit years old. Um, and we've raised, as um, I said earlier, about $15 million of, business, of, of, of investment from VCs. We'll probably raise a fair bit more in the future as we grow into a bigger global business. We don't really need to. We're currently pretty profitable and doing pretty well and growing pretty fast, which is exciting. But um, the story of Huddle is definitely one of money um, because we keep on running out of it. Um, so in the course of Huddle, we've nearly run out of money about three times at least. Um, you're, um, especially in the early days. We haven't done it recently, which is nice. Um, but it's definitely a story of money and um, of a big vision, um, of a big global business and what it takes to, to build that. So, so what are some of the biggest learn lessons learned apart from trying not to run out of money again? Um, the first one, I guess, is all about getting your business off the ground. So what does it take to get a business off the ground? Um, well, a lot of beer is actually the answer. Um, Huddle was my, so Huddle was my third startup, right? And I remember um, it, when I was working at Dunhumby, sitting with my head in my hands on the toilet, where I do a lot of thinking, and um, just thinking, why am I so depressed? And the reason I was so depressed is because it's that rule of living your life by um, what happens if you get hit by a bus. If you're about to get hit by a bus, what's the last thing that goes through your mind? And the last thing that goes through my mind was, why haven't I started a really successful big business? Done two that were all right. Worked someone else, that went really well. Built them, I want to start my own. So, what does it take to get off the ground? And the answer is just getting off and doing it. JFDR, just fucking do it. So, we had some beers, we had a big vision, we had a problem we were trying to solve, and we came up with an idea. So, we had this idea, we knew there was a problem, because the problem I'd had is I was managing a team of 300 people globally with lots of different customers, partners, suppliers, and we couldn't work together. We spent millions on Microsoft tools, hated them all. Thought there's got to be a better way. So we knew there's a problem, but and we thought we knew how to solve it. So we thought, well, if we build it, will can we get people to come? So if, you know, the classic film quote: "If we build it, will they come?" And if you're building a, a B2B product, this is a key question. It's different, slightly different B2B, B2C. Um, B2B, you can get customers involved really early, and this is the iteration we went through. There's the initial whiteboard. That's the original design of Huddle that Andy, my co-founder, did four and a half bit years ago, and it looks remarkably the same now. Um, and then we got some existing customers in, or some people we knew, friends, family, potential customers thought, if we built this, would you buy it? And their answer was, yes, we would. So that became our first customers. Um, even though the product wasn't built yet, we had an idea of what it's going to look like, etc. So the first lesson I would say, especially in B2B, slightly different in B2C, and Martin might have something to say in a kind of a mass consumer proposition, is um, get people involved early. Don't try and copy plate things too much to get them perfect. Get feedback and start iterating because even if you think you know the problem, which we did, it's still understanding exactly what your customers and users want is, is really important. It gives you feedback, it gives you confidence, it gives you proof. So then we, we thought we had the problem nailed or a way to solve it, but we, we, we haven't built it yet. We built a nice slide deck and when you clicked on it, it looked like a product. Good faking, but it wasn't actually a product. So we thought, well, how are we going to build it? So um, we got um, the, uh, some friends of ours, or guys I'd spent a couple of years getting to know, um, to help us build it. These are deeply technical guys, run a fantastic software business in London called Neoworks, and they built the prototype for us. And the lesson we learned there was, don't be afraid to give away a bit of your business if you need to get something off the ground. We had some life savings, we had some money that we'd made from previous businesses and that could get us off the ground, but we didn't have enough to build a very big business and build a very complicated product. So we enlisted their help and they put in some of their time and sweat equity and a lot of resources to build a fantastic product for us and in exchange got a small bit of the business. The rationale being, um, nothing of nothing is nothing, something of nothing is still nothing, something of something is something. So even if you have to give away a little bit of your business or get other people involved early, do it if it gets you towards where you want to be. And the other rationale about this is we did a pretty good deal with them, a pretty punchy deal. They got a very small stake in this business and did a load of work on it. And at the time, everyone said, that's a very punchy deal you've done with these guys. You know, that's a, they've given away, you know, you've given away a very small amount of your business in exchange for a lot. But they've already exited. They've already made money out of Huddle. They've done very well out of it because the... If you're building a big business, you need to start big. 
Don't, don't give away you know, 30, 50% of your business to get you know, a prototype off the ground. Think big from the very beginning because everything you do is based on that. So we built the product and we uh, had it built. We had some guys helping us. We had an office. We had a real product. We had some customers. We realized that we wanted to raise some more cash. Um, that's the whole running out of money thing again. And we realized we needed a rich person to help us. And so we used this book, which is a great book, by the way, if you, if you haven't read it. But it's quite old now, I guess it's maybe about 10 years old. But it's still as relevant as today. And it, more importantly, it's very thin, and it has big words in it, which is good for me. Um, it's called The Beer Mat Entrepreneur by Mike Southern. He's a great speaker. And basically what it says is, there's, a couple, there's loads of tips in there, but one of them is that if you want to find money early on, find a rich person. And the way to find a rich person is through a rich person's PA. And um, Andy, we, we needed a rich person to help build our business and give us some more money to keep growing it. And Andy, my co-founder, had previously left his old business where the guy who ran it was a guy called Charles, very successful entrepreneur, built a big fiber optics business, sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars to Global Crossing, floated it at the height of the, um, the last dot-com boom for billions. So wealthy guy, just sold his business again. And um, Andy uh, had got to know his PA pretty well. I won't explain how, but um, he got to know his PA pretty well. So when we wanted to speak to a rich guy who was, had money but also was very experienced and could really mentor us as young entrepreneurs, we decided to call Charles. So we didn't call Charles, we called up his PA. His PA got us 10 minutes on his route to work from his home in Newbury to his office in his Aston at 8.30 in the morning. Got us, you know, that was the, got us 10 minutes of which Andy could pitch, huddle where he was, if you want to get involved. That was enough to get us a coffee in London, which was then enough to get us into our office, which was actually our developer's office, um, to fake it, to, give, to get him to give us some money to build the business. And that's how we got um, some money out of him. So when we were talking to him, um, he really just cared about four things, and this is the whole raising money thing. Um, he cared about how big was the market? Were we going after a big problem? Did we have a really big, ambitious thing to solve? He cared about how good was our product? Was it sexy? And for us, the name was a big part of it. You know, being able to go home and tell his mates or his wife that he was investing in his young guy, he's this really cool product, it's called Huddle, it's all about getting in a huddle and kind of in business, it was, was quite cool for him. Um, so sex sells, it's amazing how important that is. Um, and did we have momentum? Did we seem like we were going somewhere that, that was kind of exciting to him? And, and for him, he felt we were. We were getting customers, there was lots of people talking about us, and he was really excited to be involved. And then the last question, and we've heard this many times from many people, from many investors, especially in the very early days, was how, how credible are we? It was basically all about us. He wasn't really investing in, he was investing in a name, a sexy looking product, and a, um, and a, and a team, a team of a couple of guys who we thought were pretty credible. It's all about you, all about you. It doesn't matter if you haven't started a business before, really. Some of the best businesses and the biggest businesses in the world, as we all know, have been started by people with no business experience. It's actually a great attribute, um, having that bravery. Um, so it's all about you. What do you have? The kind of the vision? Do you have the singularity of purpose? Do you have some experience and knowledge about what you're doing? You know, whether it's computer science, whether you're building a, a very technical clean tech product, or just of the problem. In my case, it was the problem. I knew the problem we were trying to solve. And that's a quote from one of our current investors, um, Ben Tompkins, who says, "Good people will just figure it out." Yeah. So he will give. Um, companies money and if they've got good enough people that money buys time to figure out how to build a really big business that's all money gets you is time there are lots of other routes to raising money early on um, Charles was one just to, just to put it in perspective right so Charles invested 150 grand in our business early on he on the same day as he invested 150 grand in us he bought a racing Aston Martin for 150 grand which he wrote off two weeks later um, his, um, his investment in Huddle is still going strong and is worth a lot more than that now, which is good. Point is, is he saw it as a punt. He liked our idea. So that's one route, finding a rich person. There are lots of other great routes, and one of them is here, sitting in the front row, um, Reshma from Seacamp, um, Y Combination in the US, TechCrunch50, um, Angel Groups, um, lots of other ways to raise that early, early money. But um, finding a rich person is always very useful. So some of the dirty little secrets you might want to know um, and we can go into this afterwards in more detail, but when you, if you are raising money, if you are talking to an investor, um, apart from remembering the four rules, numbers mean nothing, your business plan means nothing, because in the early days it's all fake anyway, it's all made up, and investors know that and you know that. Um, competitive tension is everything, 
having lots of people wanting to invest in you or talk to you, it's like sales. You know, it's the same. Um, set a deadline. We almost ran out of money the second time when we um, went into the summer, um, thinking we were going to raise money in the middle of the summer, and then Ben, um, our investor, went on holiday, hang gliding in the Alps for two months. That wasn't very useful, because um, we almost ran out of money. So you have to you know, set a deadline and get it done. Um, and, and then things like, you know, people always ask, how do we value our business? How do we know how much to raise? Well, basically, if, you, if I'm giving you money for your business, I'm going to want a, a share of that business. Okay, so if you say I want, and, I, and this person says I want 20% you know, of the business or 30%, which is often the way early on, I want a third of your business, and you say, well, I need 10 grand, well, you've just valued your business at 30 grand. That's not great, is it? It doesn't really help. So it's, it's, it's a pretty simple, it's pretty illogical the way you value your business early on, but you've got nothing else to go on. So basically, ask for a lot of money and value it at a big number to get going. And then the last lesson I guess is all about faking it till you make it. So in the early days when you haven't got anything, you've got to build perception, make it look big, go out, get yourself out there, go to networking events, go to things like this, present at big things. PR is always your best friend. Getting hype, getting mentioned on TechCrunch. Um, getting revenues, any revenues, just to get yourself up the very early day, just to get it off the ground. And that's a lot about what we, we went after, you know, presenting at big conferences, getting ourselves written up in TechCrunch. Um, starting your own event is always good. You know, if you want to get people talking about you, start an event that people can come to. Bootstrap it until you can make it. Fake it until you make it. And there's some amazing stories. You know, the Saatchis, when they, won, when they broke away from their first um, um, media business and wanted to win the BA account, they, they faked an entire office, staffed with models of staff, so they could look, it looked like they had a huge, really sexy looking agency. And they won the BA account, and then that was the making of their agency. There's some amazing stories in there. And then lastly, you know, we've got the business, we got going, we had some money, and we, we decided that classic story, go big or go home. You know, are you going to build a really big business? And we decided we did, and so we raised a bit more money. Um, we grew from two to four to whatever that is, eight, nine. Kept on growing over the years, had some good times. Um, did some big old deals with some big old companies, like getting Huddle put on every single laptop, HP Make. Um, raising more money to expand into the US. Um, in San Francisco, which is all very exciting. Um, moving into new offices to get, you know, building more people in, in London. That's in Silicon Roundabout, so um, our office looks directly onto the, the lovely roundabout. Um, and then, you know, you start, as you start to raise your head above the parapet, build a bigger business, you start to get in some interesting debates or fights with people, like Google trying to steal our name earlier this year for Google+, Plus, which we won, which was nice. Um, issuing a cease and desist to them is always good fun. Um, then we decided to do the same to Microsoft, at their SharePoint com we really don't like SharePoint, by the way. Um, we marched a marching band into their conference, 120 people dressed as huddlers, complete with pom-poms, and then started taking up billboards against them as well, which is always good fun. So it's a great ride, and um, who knows where we're going to be in 20, no, 20, uh, 2014, but I think as Martin will, will say, I won't, we won't be on a beach, we'll be starting something else. Um, so I hope those are five little tips, and I know we'll do more at the panel, but I hope that was interesting. Thanks, guys.